Uh, now, the conference uh, should have happened in 2020, and I was originally, I wanted to originally talk about uh, an article which was recent at that time. It's not so recent by now. I still want to talk about it because once I, I presented at an online conference, but I don't think it makes the same kind of impact. And uh, I, I do consider it uh, sort of nice and, and important, and yet it doesn't really have uh, citation, so perhaps now that I will present it here. Uh, but I also want to talk about something more recent. This is uh, something together with Mate Matolci. Uh, so I will try the impossible to talk about two articles in the in the given time. Uh, let's begin. I don't have to introduce what mutually unbiased bases are, we all know, but I just want to point out that I want to talk about systems of mutually unbiased bases. So we have a number of orthonormal bases so that any two of them uh, are mutually unbiased to each other. Now, uh, instead, of, instead of basis vectors, uh, we, can, we can describe such a system in terms of orthogonal projections, orthogonal projections onto the basis vectors. And then what do we have? We have uh, some orthogonal projections indexed by two symbols because one corresponds to the basis label and the other one inside the basis which, uh, uh, which element we are talking about. And uh, what do these projections satisfy? So when they are from the same basis, but they are different, then they, they, they sort of disjoint in the sense that their product is zero, they sum to the identity. And uh, when they are from two different bases, then the trace of the product is precisely one over D. And okay, so this is this is a kind of equivalent description of mutually unbiased basis as long as you are uninterested by phases, and we are not interested by phases. So and dimensions of those projections are arbitrary. Oh, the dimension is fixed, you see, because if you if you sum here for let's say for J, then here you get the identity, and so you get that the trace of uh, this projection is is one. So it's actually implicitly written there. Thank you. Uh, now. It's uh, easy to see that the number of uh, bases must be smaller or equal than uh, the dimension plus one with equality holding if and only if these pro orthogonal projections span the space of uh, D by D matrices, in which case we say it's a complete system. And now, ladies and gentlemen, something completely different or perhaps not so different as we shall see. I will talk about finite planar uh, Geometry. So these are combinatorial designs. They are uh, combinatorial objects, uh, but they are somehow uh, motivated by by the geometry of lines and points on the Euclidean plane. So we are not talking about the Euclidean plane, but the, the definition is is in is motivated by that. But but it's given just like a graph by two two kind of things a set of point a finite set which we refer to as the set of points and some subsets of these points which we will call lines so that's it we have just some subset which we will call lines of course satisfying some nice properties all these properties coming from from planar geometry for example what if we have what if we have a line and another line such that they do not intersect then on, on the plane they would be parallel right not not in not in three dimensions but but on the plane they would be parallel and the parallel relation is an equivalence relation right so so that means that we want to have something like this if you have three lines such that such that uh, the first two do not intersect and also the second and the third do not intersect, then the first and the third should not intersect also. In other words, we will have parallel classes of lines, equivalence classes. And then if you have a point, let me draw, if you have a point somewhere and the line and the point is not on the line, then we should have a line passing through this point, which is parallel, uh, to the first given line. This is what is written here in an abstract manner. So together, these, these first two requirements actually tell you that, that uh, an equivalence class, a parallel class of lines is just a partitioning of your set. 
And then, uh, okay, so this, this should be evident for any two lines, uh, the intersection uh, should consist of at most one point. And finally, some kind of completeness property for any two points, there is a line uh, containing both points. And in what follows, the first three uh, kind of requirements we will always have, but we will view the fourth one as some kind of optional one. Okay. So, so suppose you have such a kind of structure, such a given structure, uh, satisfying at least those three requirements, so not necessarily the optional one, and, and say it has at least three parallel classes, then it's not difficult to see that it follows automatically that every line contains the same number of points. So I will call this number D. And actually every parallel class also contains D lines. And, uh, and the number of points we have is just D squared. And uh, so we call, we, we talk about a so-called K net, K being the number of parallel classes of order D. This, this is the, the so-called order of our structure. Moreover, a K net of order D satisfies this completeness property if and only if, surprise, surprise, if and only if the number of parallel classes is precisely D plus one, in which case it's called an affine plane of order D. Of course, we can, uh, so the same kind of geometrical or same kind of combinatorial object, this affine plane of order D, one can, one can describe it in different manners. One can describe it using orthogonal Latin squares. One can describe it in terms of a projective plane. But I chose to, to really view it as an affine plane of order D because this is how you will see the similarities with the mutually unbiased basis. Okay, I wanna give you a quick example of an order three K net. Uh, so that means that we are going to have nine points and I arrange them in a, in, a, in a square and then one parallel class, so one partitioning could be just, just the rows, right? Now we need another partitioning, another parallel class that could be just the columns. So observe that uh, as it should be, every green line intersects every blue line exactly at one point. Now, we want to give yet another parallel class. So now we need lines that, that intersect each previous lines precisely in one point. For example, this could be it, right? But not only that, these three points or these three points. So actually we have an entire parallel class. So now it's a three net of order three. And actually one can complete it and make it a four net of order three. So this would be an affine plane. Okay, so we have some curious similarities uh, and there are some interesting correspondences with the MUB systems. So perhaps the very first thing to note, completeness. So in both cases, for a K net of order D and also for, yes? The definition of complete uh, maps, I'm not familiar with it and it went very fast. Okay, so the completeness was just simply that these orthogonal projections, they span the, the, D, the space of D by D matrices. That's it. Okay. This is, so, and the interesting thing is that in both, in, in both, both cases, it's just equivalent to the fact that K, the number of parallel classes or the number of bases is just simply D plus one. Okay, so finite fields can be used to give nice constructions of affine planes in every prime power dimension. And not surprisingly, finite fields can be used to give nice construction of, of complete MUB systems in every prime power. So what about if, uh, if your K net is not uh, complete? Say you have a K net of order D where K is D. So you know, for completeness, you would need D plus one for uh, classes, but you only have D. Then it's not difficult to see that this can be completed. So you can always find one more parallel class of lines and you can make it an affine plane. And the same actually holds for MUB systems. So, 
So if you already found D bases in the D-dimensional space, then you ought to have a D plus one space. This is something I proved some 10 years ago. Okay, and what about if, if, if we have more, uh, more bases missing? So for example, what about a three net of order four? So for completeness, you would need five parallel classes, right? Okay, so there is an example of a three net of order four that cannot be completed to an affine plane. Let me point out that there is a complete uh, structure, an affine plane of order four. That's not a problem because four is a prime power, but you can start in a wrong manner. You can choose wrong lines and then you can't complete it anymore. So you can, you can, you can choose three parallel classes that cannot be completed. And surprise, surprise, there exists a, MUB system containing three bases in four dimensions that cannot be completed. So although there is complete system in four dimensions, you can give three bases that cannot be completed. And I guess the similarities uh, go on and on, but uh, these are the ones I listed here. So by now you should perhaps uh, suspect that uh, these these uh, MUB systems are some kind of non-commutative versions of, uh, of, of our classical K-nets, classical, uh, classical um, combinatorial designs K-net. And uh, to put them in a common framework, I will uh, consider a finite dimensional C-star algebra. Uh, what I have in mind is that this C-star algebra, I will choose to be when I choose to be the algebra of D by D matrices, uh, I should get back uh, the quantum case, namely I should get back neutral unbiased basis. And when I choose this algebra to be commutative, it just means that it's essentially the set of scalar functions over a finite set of points. You know, functions can be multiplied, they can be added together, they form a commutative algebra. Uh, then I should recover in some manner uh, classical k nets. Okay, and here is my definition. Oh, no, not yet definition. Let, let me just comment on the fact that in, a, in an abstract theta algebra, the notion of orthogonal projections is, is, uh, is clear. So you, you don't need to have matrices to talk about orthogonal projections. Uh, you can also talk about minimal projections. Uh, that's uh, well defined. And uh, Okay, let me just point out that in the classical case, so when, when uh, your algebra is uh, just uh, the algebra of, of scalar functions on, on some finite set, then what does it mean that a function is a projection? What does it mean that it squares to itself? It just means that it should take values one and zero only. In other words, it should be the characteristic function of, of, a, of a subset. So actually, orthogonal projections in the in the classical case they just correspond to subsets uh, another thing uh, to note that the finite dimensional c star algebra always has a, a, a canonical trace uh, which is just a linear functional uh, with these two trace like properties and uh, Yes, of course, if uh, your algebra is the set of D by D matrices, this is just the usual trace. But if your algebra is, is uh, the commutative algebra of functions, uh, scalar functions over a set, then this trace is just uh, given by this simple summation over, over the, the base set. Okay, so here is my definition of what a K-net over a general finite dimensional C star algebra should be. Uh, I, I, I view this as a, it's just a system of orthogonal projections satisfying the following properties. The, the, the kind of parallel relation, namely that P equals to Q or that they, they are sort of disjoint, it should be an equivalence relation dividing N into equivalence classes, which, which we can call the parallel classes. Uh, if uh, two projections uh, belong to different equivalence classes, then the trace of their product should be a fixed value. So this, in the classical case, because of that summation formula, is just 
counting the number of points in the intersection of the two sets and you know for two lines that should be one and for two orthogonal projections in the MUB case, this should be one over D. So this is the right kind of generalization, which gives back both values. And the sum of the elements in each parallel class should be the identity. Okay, so this is this is our general structure. One second, I mean, tracial I, I identity should be to the, the, let's say, the dimension of the space. We don't have a space. So the trace for you, trace identity is one? No, certainly not. Uh, so the C star algebra is an abstract algebra. These operators, they do not act on a space. They are just abstract algebraic elements. So what's, to, what's to your identity? Identity is, an, is a well-defined element. It's the element is the only element such that this times okay. any other element is itself. And the trace is a well-defined functional. It's normalized so that on minimal projections, it takes the value one. So we can't talk about the dimension of the space. We can talk about the dimension of the algebra, but that's, there is no underlying space. The trace of identity is what? Is what it is. <laughs> so in, you know how much it is in the classical case and you know how much is it in the quantum case. If it's the set of D by D matrices, this is D. But what if it's, it's a, it's the, you know, what, what if you are dealing with the, just the scalar functions on a finite set, how much is this? So what is identity? Identity is the constant one function. What about the trace? That's just the number of points. So basically you're saying uh, the expression trace identity depends on the representation of your system. Yes, I, I want to, not, not on the representation of the C algebra, but depends on in what C algebra I am. Okay, and so not difficult to X to C that uh, using uh, this definition. Sorry, in the previous definition, do you need the projection to be minimal or you don't? No, no, I don't require. And in fact, they are not in general because what about the classical case? The classical case, these lines, the subsets, are they minimal? Do they contain just a single point? Certainly not. No, I do not require. Okay, so it's easy to see that if, uh, if uh, you have at least three parallel classes, then similarly to, the, to what we had, uh, every parallel class will contain the same number of elements. So we can call this number D to be the order of our structure. Uh, the dimension of the algebra must actually be D squared. There is no choice here. Every projection will have the same trace value. And uh, so I will, I will call this kind of structure a generalized k-net of order d over our c algebra A. And this k, the number of parallel classes, must be smaller or equal than d plus 1. And the equality holds if and only if these projections span, linearly span, the full algebra. So this is completeless. Moreover, if you take uh, the quantum case, if your algebra is the set of D by D matrices, then yes, you recover mutually unbiased basis. So it, this definition just tells you that, that uh, you are talking about the set of uh, projections uh, coming from an, a mutually unbiased basis system. And if your algebra is, is the commutative one, then you recover classical finite K-nets, okay? So now we have a common framework which contains both classical k-nets, class, these classical uh, combinatorial designs and mutually unbiased bases. It's just the choice of the C-style algebra which makes them uh, different. But why is it good to have a common framework? Is it just for the fun of it? No, the idea is that if you have a common framework apart from being able to confront them in a in a nicer manner, uh, you could try to prove generic kind of statements that then will hold once and all uh, for both structures rather than having a separate proof for mutual unbiased basis and another one for classical K nets. Okay, but of course, we are interested by something non trivial, so not, not just some kind of trivial statements. And we found one nice example of such kind of thing. This is rigidity. Now, what do I mean by rigidity? Let me just 
say that a square is rigid in what sense? If I give you three of its vertices, then there is no choice where the force vertex must be, right? It must be here. That's it. So it's, it's, it's in some sense a rigid structure. How rigid it is? Well, three of its vertices determine all of the vertices. So you might ask, together with the knowledge of, of uh, the span of these projections, how many parallel classes of a K-net determine the full K-net? How many of them I need to know? Or to put it in another way, for what value of R, depending of course on K and uh, the order D, it, it is true that if you have two K-nets of order D over the same C star algebra uh, with the same span, then, and they differ in at most R parallel classes, then they in fact must be the same. So for example, this is just a, this is just a kind of similar structure with a square, you have that if two squares coincide on three vertices, then in fact, the two squares, they do. Yes. yes. Uh, help me understand the example of uh, dimension, I think, four you gave, where you have unextendable triples. Yes. That would not be a rigid uh, case then. I, 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 didn't, I didn't say that. No, no, no. I'm asking whether that is true, because if I have these three mutually unbiased bases, that corresponds to some RKD, but, uh, and I have a complete set. But uh, I can't, uh, they, they are not, I can't use the first one and extend it to the complete set. And therefore, this is not. Uh, that, that is just saying that they are different. They are non-isomorphic. But I want to have two structures that do coincide on some, on some basis or on some parallel class. And I'm asking on how many they can coincide. Okay, and, and be they, still different. Yeah, because they don't coincide, they can't be these three they, they coincide in a trivial manner because, for example, you could always say that my first basis yes. was the same. Yeah. yeah, but the second one is already not the same. Okay, so in one special case, the answer was already known, namely uh, in, the, in the case of affine planes. So this is a classic result of, of, of Brook. Uh, and he essentially proved that if they differ in at most root of D parallel classes, then in fact, they must be the same affine planes. And just note that when the dimension is, uh, is P squared P is a prime, then you can actually give two affine planes of order D on a common point set so that they share p squared minus p parallel classes, but they do differ in the remaining p plus one parallel classes. So the result of Brick is essentially sharp. Why do I say essentially? Because I'm not saying that in every dimension it's sharp, but there is an infinite sequence of uh, dimensions in which it is sharp. Okay, uh, so actually we checked and this construction can be carried over to mutually unbiased bases. So you can't expect mutually unbiased bases to be more rigid than, than, uh, than let's say, affine planes, because, because you can repeat, you can give example of two complete set of mutually unbiased bases that uh, actually coincide in quite many bases and yet differ in the remaining ones. And what is our main result? We prove something similar to Brooke's theorem, but in a completely different manner. So the proof of Brooke, we couldn't use at all. That's a combinatorial one, but we need some, we don't have a combinatorial structure. So we couldn't even use even the idea of its, its proof. We had to do something completely different. So if A is a finite dimension C star algebra, and you have two K nets of order D given on this algebra such that their linear span coincide and they share quite many uh, common parallel classes. So they differ in at most root D parallel classes. Then in fact, the two K nets must be the same. This is a generalization of Brick results. Uh, you recover the, the, the result of Brick when, uh, when, these are, when, when A is commutative and the span of these uh, 
uh, nets uh, is just uh, just the full algebra, meaning they are they are affine planes. Okay, we also find found some nice application of uh, this result. Uh, for example, we used it to prove that if you have a large enough uh, mutually unbiased basis system having a certain symmetry, then if it can be completed at all, then the completion will also have this symmetry. Okay, so this is not difficult to conclude from, from this uh, rigidity result. And uh, okay, so many, many MUB systems are actually constructed using some. I, I don't want to define everything, but for example, you could say that you have uh, a unitary whose adjoint action just permutes these projections, but this, it does not change the set of all of these projections. Okay. Uh, so many MUB systems are constructed using some projective representation of certain abelian groups. And then you start to construct these MUB systems larger and larger ones. And then at some point you get stuck. And then, then you wonder whether this could be continued, whether this could be even completed. And it's, it's e easy to check that, well, no, using this construction, relying on the projective representation, but perhaps, perhaps it could be completed, uh, but not using this projective representation of the abelian group, just, just somehow, right? So, so people talk about weak incompatibility and Incompatibility and it's unclear in general if they are the same. But by our result, if the system is large enough, then the answer is actually yes. And in this manner, uh, oh, okay. So in, in this manner, we managed to, to give, for example, large uh, MUB systems that uh, we can show that cannot be completed uh, to a complete system. Okay, so this was uh, the, the, the 2020 article, and now I want to talk about the, the result with uh, Mate. Uh, okay, so, so far we generalized the notion of, for example, the notion of complete uh, system of mutual unbiased basis to include classical affine planes. And now I will talk about another possible generalization of, of a complete system of mutually unbiased basis. So again, we have our orthonormal bases, and this time, this time I leave them uh, as uh, as vectors rather than projections. But I collect them in a in a in a set, and I for I, I kind of forget uh, the elements are coming from which bases. So I really just treat it as a set. It's a completely unordered set. And then if I view it in, in such a manner, then what do I see? Well, I see d times d plus one vectors, unit vectors, right? Such that the scalar, the absolute value of the scalar product of any two is either zero, and that was you know, when they are orthogonal, when they are coming from the same basis, or one over d. That was when, when they were unbiased. And the question I will ask, suppose you have d plus, d times d plus one unit vectors in the d-dimensional space such that the absolute value of the scalar product of any two is either zero or one over d do they must form a complete system of mutually unbiased basis so can they be arranged into d plus one orthonormal basis if not, then of course, possibly these kind of sets are, are more general structure than complete system of mutually unbiased bases. Now, why we were interested by this kind of question? So here is a quick motivation. There's an important type of problem given an abelian group and a subset of this abelian group, which I will refer to as an allowed, allowed set of differences. We want to find a large set of, uh, of elements such that the difference between any two falls in this allowed set of differences. And the question is how large this set can be. There are lots of famous problems that can be fitted into this kind of scheme, such as uh, words with given minimal Hamming distance, uh, I, I mean, to, to find the largest number of, uh, 
of words with given a minimal Hamming distance or, or this, this the famous sphere packing kind of problem. Uh, perhaps less known, but the question about the existence of a complete collection of Michelin Bell's bases is also such a problem. Let's see why and how. So suppose, again, we have a mutually unbiased uh, MUB system, but this time the only thing I did that I changed a little bit the, the numbering. So the, my first basis is now denoted as basis number zero, because I want to think of this basis as some kind of standard basis, or let's say this is the standard basis. And then all other basis vectors will be vectors with well, after a suitable scaling, will be vectors with uh, just unit uh, entries. So the entries are from the d-dimensional torus. And this is an abelian group under just pointwise multiplication. And moreover, if I take two such vectors with appropriate scaling, so here are the entries, then their scalar product or the absolute value square of the scalar product, here it is the absolute value square, and this term, uh, zk conjugate times z prime k, is just the case component of this product, where here product is really the group product, and the inverse is the group inverse. So this is entry-wise product and entry-wise inverse, right? So that means that the, scale, the absolute value squared of the scalar product is just a function of this expression. So if I take the group to be uh, the d-dimensional torus, and I take the difference set to be what is written here, then actually uh, these vectors, so the vectors of, of the remaining bases, they, they form a so-called allowed collection. The difference in this respect of any two falls in this set because the scalar product, the absolute value squared of the scalar product of any two is either zero or one over d. So, uh, that means that the famous Delsart method, which is a linear programming method, can be used to give upper bounds on the number of, uh, of vectors you can have here. Uh, and some moderate successes have been achieved uh, by Mati Matochi and myself using this method. They are all of the type, okay, so we didn't manage to prove, of course, that there is no complete system of mutual unbiased basis in dimension six, but let me. Why not? Why not? Uh, not yet, <laughs> but he will do it today. But here, for example, we only assume the first basis to be the standard basis, which is of course something you can always do, but you can't assume the second basis to be something specific. But if we do so, say we take the Fourier basis or one of the bases uh, from the Fourier family, then of course we can do a little bit more and then we could exclude the existence of a complete set of mutually unbiased bases. So yes, some moderate successes, but of course the goal would be, for example, to exclude the existence of a complete system of mutually unbiased bases in dimension six. But you see, this, this Delsart method does not use that the elements of B can be grouped into an orthonormal basis. Just the fact that the, the kind of difference or the scalar product of any two is either zero or in absolute value squared is one over D. And so, so that's why that's that's why we want to know whether it, 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 is this a kind of more general structure than complete system of mutually unbiased bases? And the theorem is that no. So if you have uh, this many vectors in in CD unit vectors such that this absolute value squared of the scalar product is either zero or one over d between any two, then they must form a complete MUB system. So just to make you understand what the statement is about, uh, let's say these are my vectors in a kind of abstract sense. So each dot uh, stands for, for a vector. And then I wanna, I wanna kind of note the orthogonality relation. We get a graph, right? So I will connect any two which are orthogonal. And a priori, we could just get any kind of graph. One, one should say, of course, if you are in three dimensions, for example, these are nine points or, yeah, anyway, so depending on the dimension, you cannot have too many orthogonalities. This is clear because you can't give a lot of orthogonal vectors in a 6D dimensional space. But this graph could be anything. And where I, where I did not connect uh, points, of course, what I mean is that those are 
those are unbiased. So this, then the absolute value square of the cellular product is this one over D. Okay, and, and so, so could this be the, the graph? If, if, if this could be the graph, then our theorem was false. Yeah? But instead, what we want to show is that this graph looks something like, like that. So that actually my drawing is not okay because I should have included a force basis. Yeah? So each of these triangles stand for three mutually orthogonal vectors. So that's a, that's a basis. And then I should have also a force one. Get the last one for free. The last one for free, but I did not draw it here. Okay, so this is what we want to prove. Okay, I just quickly show you the, the idea of the proof because it's sort of nice and uh, simple. Uh, consider the gram matrix of these vectors. Okay, so this is a positive semi definite matrix. Its rank is at most D because, because uh, it's the gram matrix of vectors from a D dimensional space. And its trace is just the number of, uh, of vectors we have. And so you can write down an easy inequality, which, is, which holds for any positive semi-definite matrix, namely that the trace of the, the square of G is larger or equal than the kind of average non-zero eigenvalue. This is the average non-zero eigenvalue, right? The trace over the rank squared times the rank. And Okay, so how about this? How about the trace of G squared? The trace of G squared is just the sum of the absolute value squares of these values. So when J equals to K, then you get one, and this happens D times, D plus one times, because this is the number of vectors. When they are orthogonal, then the contribution is zero, but when they are unbiased, then, well, there is a contribution of one over D. So, so this is how much uh, the trace of G squared, uh, you can give an estimate on, on, on on what's on the other side. And so you get a lower estimate on the number of, of unbiasedness between these vectors. Now, you can also consider these orthogonal projections onto, onto these uh, unit vectors. And, uh, and I did subtract the term one over D time, my, times the identity, so they will become traceless matrices. And then I write on the, the gram matrices. Okay, so gram matrices with respect to the Hilbert-Schmidt uh, scalar product. I did not put a star here because these are self-adjoint anyway. And it's easy to see that this trace value is uh, D minus one over D if J equals to K, zero if, uh, if the vector BJ and BK were actually unbiased. That's why, that's why I did subtract this term. And minus one over D if... Uh, if uh, the, the index J and K correspond to orthogonal vectors. So again, we can do a, a similar kind of uh, estimation using this time the gram matrix G, G tilde rather than G. And this will give us a lower bound on the number of orthogonality relations. Okay, but together the, the orthogonal ones and the unbiased ones, if you sum the number of relations, you should get uh, uh, to choose M because, because you have that many pairs between these vectors. And so from the, this and the previous two estimates, we actually get that the number of unbiased, unbiasedness, so how many unbiasedness relation you have is M times D squared and, and the orthogonal iterations M times D minus one. I write as it should be because for example, how many unbiasedness relations you should have? Each vector is unbiased to how many other vectors? Well, all vectors of the remaining D basis, that's D squared vectors. That's why, that's why you should have this term here. So you, you do get this, okay? But also because, because you have strict inequalities, uh, from here, you actually get that the rank of G tilde is, is uh, really d squared minus one. It's not smaller or equal. I said it's smaller or equal than d squared minus one because remember, these were matrices from a d squared minus one dimensional space because the space of all matrices is, of course, d squared dimensional, but they were all traceless. And, oops, uh, moreover, all non zero eigenvalues of G tilde, uh, they must coincide. And so that means if I, if I, if I do the following linear combination, I, I combine G tilde and the identity with appropriate uh, coefficients, I get a matrix that I denoted by A. A nice question would be why I use the letter A. 
And I use the letter A because, anyone knows? That's very good. Can you say it louder? This is going to be the adjacency matrix of our graph. It's precisely the adjacency matrix with this scaling. So AJK is one if the vectors corresponding to the index J and K are orthogonal and zero otherwise. In other words, we actually managed to get the spectrum of the adjacency matrix. Another question, does the spectrum determine the graph? And the answer is, unfortunately, no. <laughs> oh. So in general, you can have two different graphs, non-isomorphic graphs, so that the, the adjacency matrices share the same spectrum. Okay, so I say this can happen. Exactly, exactly. So question about drum. Yes, yes. Can you hear the shape of? Yes. So this can happen, but that doesn't mean that this must happen. Uh, so now you consider our specific graph. It's a rather simple one. What do we want to show? That our graph is just uh, consists of D plus one disjoint complete Ds, right? Because an orthogonal basis is a complete D. Everyone is orthogonal to everyone. And this graph, it's not difficult to show. Okay, you need a little bit of uh, graph theory, but this graph, it's easy to show that it is determined by its spectrum. So yes, we have this theorem. Thank you very much.